Let me welcome the, the panel, the first panel to, to uh, the stage. Um, if uh, Kai, Claire, uh, you can come in here, and Kunwar as well, please. Um, so in these morning sessions, we're going to really try to set the stage uh, for the day and, and start building some of the, uh, the foundations. Um, the idea for this morning is to really uh, try to understand the range of possibilities with geospatial uh, applications. And in this afternoon, we are going to take a deep dive into geospatial impact evaluations uh, with a series of lightning talks on basically two, two major uh, domains, one being climate change um, and the second being more urban development and, and, and conflict uh, 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 mediation and remediation. Um, but this morning we will start with uh, the first panel um, um, which will explore and try to understand um, the promise of geospatial analysis. Uh, for evaluation, so just just a couple of, of remarks before before we start uh, with our with our first panelist uh, uh, presentations. Um, basically, what what we can think about in evaluations is perhaps a little bit of a typology of applications. Um, at IEG, we have tried a number of uh, use cases to answer three types of questions. One is more simply, but very importantly, measurement measurement of important development concepts that then become embedded in our evaluation and we need to build a design around them, uh, but measurement is, is, is kind of a first step. The second is assessing the relevance of the interventions that uh, we have. And um, of course, geospatial uh, analysis can help us understand the relevance of targeting of our interventions. Um, but it perhaps can go beyond that. And so we also want to, to show what we've tried uh, to answer this question. And then, of course, there is the, the criterion of effectiveness, uh, which is you know, our, uh, our interventions. Are they making a difference? How, for whom, under what circumstances? Um, and of course, lies within this the question of the actual impact, meaning you know, what is the net effect of an intervention? And here, this afternoon, we'll discover uh, quite a lot of applications of that. But this, this morning, we'll also kind of plant some of the seeds for this. Um, so with this framework in mind, um, I would like to, to start with this first session. And um, uh, we have really uh, the chance of having multiple institutional uh, lenses here as well. We have our colleague from uh, the uh, Agence Française de Développement, Deval and a Data. So it's a, it's a really nice combination. Um, and um, we, will, uh, we will start with, uh, uh, with Claire. Um, I am pulling up the bio very quickly, Claire. Uh, <laughs> um, here, sorry. So Claire Sanuso is head of methods uh, and impact evaluations at the Agence Française de Développement uh, uh, in uh, independent no, evaluation office um, and uh, uh, since 2016, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, she will start us off with uh, really trying to lay out um, uh, what, the, what the team has been up to in terms of geospatial strategy for evaluations. I think the idea is to also think about not just specific applications, but how do we go about developing a, a program. So, uh, Claire, over to you. Um, I hope the slides are going to be... Yes. Yes. We're still figuring out the tech a little bit. Thank you, G. see it or we don't see it in the room which is I can start by thanking you for having me here and uh, and for this wonderful initiative of uh, this get together even to unlock the potential of uh, geodata for evaluation and uh, it's my pleasure to invite you uh, for discovery tour of AFD uh, journey to unlock uh, uh, this uh, potential of uh, geospatial analysis for evaluation. 
uh, we started uh, this journey almost 10 years ago. And uh, so it, here we are, almost still a couple of issues. Yeah, so now it's there. Okay, yeah. but so Claire has to come here to, yeah. okay. It's not working, it's a PowerPoint, so. Sorry right. about that, so. Claire, you're going to have to come to the podium. <laughs> This one? Yeah. Okay. Good. So I was saying, I will try to invite you to a journey uh, on the geospatial use for evaluation. So first, why first we, start, we decided to start uh, the journey? I guess it's very common to all of our institution uh, the, the potential we saw in geospatial information was to be able to, to locate, to, to geotag precisely the activities uh, of Agence Française de Développement. Uh, this, the second uh, potential was to have a global coverage because we are very much engaged in uh, uh, climate change, in natural resources management and uh, we are covering large areas and it's very complicated when it comes to monitor uh, the activities and the results of our development uh, interventions uh, to precisely and rigorously measure it. So clearly there is from the sky a very strong potential of improve uh, the, the, the measurement of this coverage. And finally, um, the time series, the fact that when we are talking about impact, most of the time it's years after the, the project timing and the impact uh, measurements start uh, when the project is done. And this is actually for us a really a tricky issue to be able to find how to collect the data and how to assess uh, the, the measurement of those impacts when it cannot rely on the monitoring uh, data collected uh, during the project time. So that was the why, that was the preliminary um, objective uh, and, and we start based on how we can use uh, those data to plan the activity, to monitor them, and then to evaluate. So at the beginning, we were not focused on evaluation. And 10 years after, uh, we are happy about this choice, uh, even if it was a bit risky because it was not our initial mandate, uh, because we learned that we could have uh, went, go faster alone, but that we need that the other part and other team within the institution and with other partners and clients uh, jump in with us in this journey to go further. Otherwise, if we don't uh, provide the tools and the knowledge of our project management team and uh, monitoring and evaluation team, uh, we will be stuck at some point in the evaluation uh, strategy. Thank you. So as I was saying, it's a 10 years journey. We started with small pilots uh, before uh, 2015, and it was about using available data uh, to better measure indicators. Um, it was not only geospatial data, but any kind of data, uh, administrative data, socioeconomic data, and geospatial data. So it was very uh, specific pilot on some projects to learn what was possible. And then the first uh, change, the first scale up uh, was in um, 20, uh, between 2017 and 2019 because we did uh, KFW AEFD exchange staff and we work on a specific group of projects to really work 
on specific geospatial impact evaluation uh, on the uh, on, on some specific sector, natural resources management and the agriculture sector. And this was the time where we built the first external partnership and that it was very useful not being alone through the journey and to share uh, very at the early stage what we, was, what we were learning about what was possible. Um, and what was important through the journey was uh, in, in gray, the time where we um, check and, and get a validation from our board to say, here we're pilot, we think it's useful. We think we can change the way we measure impact using this tool. Uh, do you agree with that? And so we had a top management support and our board support to keep going and to keep investing in new technology and new tools. And that those are key moments to make sure that, yes, for sure, our approach was a bottom-up uh, learning process, but to have a clear management support uh, to, to keep investing and, uh, and to build official large flagship partnership uh, with the French Special Agency, uh, but also with the KFW, um, and... Uh, and uh, a new one, so the last one, the Joe Ford Impact, where we are joining not only KFW but GIZ, the French uh, Development uh, Research Institute also. And if some of you are interested, we can talk about it because the idea is to, uh, to make this partnership broader. So to make it simple, uh, the three main components of our strategy to enhance the utilization of geodata in evaluation are the first one, everything about awareness, training, piloting, and learning by doing. So this is very uh, the, the bottom-up strategy. The second one is not being alone. That's why since 10 years, we are building partnership, technical partnership, uh, partnership with people who are able to provide uh, more precise uh, geospatial image, who are able to, to help us in uh, unlock um, all our technical issues regarding the storage, regarding the matching of different kind of data. So mostly the French and European special agency for this. And of course, the, the like-minded people, so other team of evaluation uh, who are fighting to, to use how we can use better this kind of data for evaluation. And a last thing that is very, that's why we are very happy to be here, is we started to contribute or to start some small community of practice internally and externally with colleagues like KFW. Uh, but definitely an international committee of practice uh, could be uh, very interesting. And last point of this uh, main components is, of course, uh, we see a lot of potential in geospatial impact evaluation. So let's say that we invest a lot on, uh, on uh, these specific tools uh, between the, all the range of possible. So just to, to show you some image, because otherwise I would not be here. <laughs> So this is two examples. I mean, we have uh, dozens of them, uh, but I pick an evaluation of um, our intervention in Dakar. Um, and the idea is that we use light time, uh, night light data uh, to have a proxy of uh, the, um, the economic uh, development uh, of Dakar and the change before and after uh, the intervention. Uh, we know that there are lots of limits in uh, using that, but at the end of the day, our learning was uh, it would have cost much more to collect uh, data from the ground uh, to arrive to an estimation that we are not sure that would have been better. So it would have taken more time uh, and definitely more budget to do the same thing. And the second learning is it was an ex-post evaluation, so everything was done. And the data collected by that time would have not allowed us to do the same uh, indicator uh, measurement. So for us, it was one of our key messages is, OK, uh, we struggle as an evaluation team when we arrive at the end to be able to measure 
all the indicators that we would like to be able to measure in terms of uh, results and impact, and definitely uh, the availability of retrospective data uh, won't solve anything. We know that it's not magic, but we are able to measure some of them, and it's already a beginning. Same thing. Uh, the other one is a project uh, on deforestation. So we are monitoring use the use lands um, in Sahel region, which is uh, another challenge for us, how to access and have data on the crisis area. Um, so it was a second um, solution for us to have better information, location, and monitor um, for project management, but also uh, measuring the impact in area where we could have, have other alternative in terms of uh, surveys. Um, a last example on project uh, evaluation. Uh, this is uh, um, a project in, uh, in Dakar and it was for uh, rice yields uh, measurement. And what is interesting is that we developed the tools to be able to, to identify the cultivated crops, to estimate yields using the vegetation index, and, uh, and then to calibrate this estimation of the vegetation index with physical data. And those physical data uh, came from the implementation agency, our clients, our local partner. So we built this, we did this pilot with them, uh, and the tool we jointly uh, tested uh, was supposed and is now a tool that our clients still use, not only for AFD projects, and so not only for the purpose of the evaluation, but also for the, all their program and uh, for uh, project management. So in terms of... Um, of impacts to change the, the, the way they are implementing the project and why, what they can measure in terms of impact. This is very, uh, the potential is very high in terms of dialogue with our clients. So here the, the tag are uh, our positive results. We know and we learn that it is identify, uh, identify uh, cultivated plots is very easy and successful. Uh, we had a red flag for estimate yields using vegetation index, and it's better with caution um, for the one where we use the physical data to calibrate our model. I'm not going further into a technical issue there, but the message is, okay, we did that in our office and with our clients and other partners, but the idea is that kind of example other institution, organization did it, did exactly the same, sometimes five or ten years before. And uh, we discovered last year in a, in, a, in a geofield forum in Rome that there was a specific session where people were talking about rice and estimated yields and everyone was doing the same uh, conclusion, and, but ev everyone is uh, spending time, money, and uh, experimenting exactly the same thing. So we do think, and we agree with uh, Sabine and Estelle, and that we can go further and faster with partnership with the community of practice, not to do all the same pilots um, alone, and to use what all of you learn, and that's what we are eager to, to learn from you and uh, on your experience on that. So um, I will finish and conclude on partnership because all around this 10 years journey, we build many of them. This is just an example of the MapMe uh, initiative with KFW um, and uh, the French uh, uh, Research Institute now that recently joined. And this picture just how it works. I mean, how we overcome isolation and create synergies among multiple projects, institutions, stakeholders, and this was the idea of the MIPME project, working on processing geo, uh, geodata products and sharing knowledge about impact indicators, um, resolving also technical issues through, through this partnership. Um, now this 
first partnership is embedded in the geo for impact uh, bigger partnership um, and you will have this afternoon on this uh, uh, on this specific uh, partnership a use case that will be presented by my colleague Ingrid Dalman and our colleague Melvin from KFW showing you the potential of sharing knowledge um, about the use of geospatial data for evaluation and impact evaluation. Uh, so the, the, their example will be about how to use the impact evaluation for portfolio analysis, and it's an internal geospatial impact evaluation to learn. Uh, here my last slide is about our pre first internal attempt of geospatial impact evaluation. It was also about protected area but it was a single project about protected area. And the idea was to be able to measure at the medium term uh, how the implementation of protected area in the Congo Basin uh, was able to uh, decrease deforestation, um, looking at the control concession without a protected uh, area system. And we were able to show that the result was positive. It was a decrease of 74%. And uh, so it was very interesting from the sky to learn that. But we also learned that the question we have uh, are about the living condition of the population there. So we have a clear limit of what we can observe from the sky. And we need the, the ground data to, to learn more about development issues. That's why we have a current second impact evaluation currently ongoing uh, with the same partners uh, to match uh, data from the ground and from the sky to know more not about deforestation, but the impact for the population um, living there. So hopefully we will be able to share soon the preliminary uh, result about that, but uh, this will be my last message. I mean, the potential is very high, but the potential of combining from the ground and from the sky intelligence, it's even uh, bigger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. You really, uh, you really already planted so many important ideas and uh, laid out some already some of the conditions under which this works. Um, uh, management support, partnership, exchange of staff, willingness to learn and, and, to, and to fail. So thank you for that. Um, let me now, we, we, we'll take questions towards the end. We, we, we would like, unless there is a clarification question, if, if there is anything in Claire's presentation that uh, really, otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll concentrate for the, the meat of the questions towards the end. So let me now um, introduce Kai Romschik, who is an evaluator at the German Institute for Evaluation in Development Cooperation, better known as DEVAL, um, and who has a, a background in empirical research. He works at the Competence Center for Evaluation Methodology, where he is trying di different things, including geospatial analysis. Um, so hopefully the slides are working. Um, over to you, Kai. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Kai Romczyk, and um, I'm working at the DEVAL uh, in the Competence Center for Evaluation Methodology, and there we leverage different uh, digital methods. And the DEVAL is an uh, institute uh, where we uh, do evaluations, and we are a federal research institute. Um, and our aim is to uh, provide uh, scientifically uh, robust evidence uh, for science, for politicians, and uh, also for implement implementing organizations. And we are not only doing evaluations, but also uh, develop methods and standards, and are also actively engaged in the um, uh, evaluation capacity development, and therefore a community of practice um, in the field of geodata and geospatial analysis also really interesting for us. Our uh, evaluations are usually uh, strategic, so we are not doing uh, single project evaluations, but usually have like broad scopes and uh, long periods that we look at. For example, the civic engagement in Afghanistan uh, of the last 20 years of the federal German government. So if we are at the beginning of the evaluation, uh, we ask ourselves, okay, um, 
what kind of methods do we want to use, what kind of design, and uh, this can get really complex at the beginning. As you can see here, what's our evaluation interest, uh, what are our evaluation questions, what dimensions, do we want to have like a theory of focus, or more from testing, um, or for theory building, or do we have a causal or a non-causal focus? And adding up to this, we also ask ourselves, okay, can we use geodata? Is it possible to use them? And if we use them, uh, what kind of uh, geospatial analysis uh, would be suitable for us? For example, a descriptive uh, mapping, a geospatial correlation, or can we use geodata to integrate d several data sources to get some insights, or to do a geospatial impact evaluation? And to get some, yeah, to simplify the, the complex uh, decisions that we have to take, um, we developed at the DEVA the geodata decision tree. And it's an orientation uh, framework with five guiding questions. And um, it depends the, on the, like the recommendations that you get, uh, get depend on the uh, information depth that we have. And now it's really small here. Okay, so the first uh, question uh, is, does the evaluation uh, interest have a geographic dimension? Then secondly, do we know the location? Thirdly, do we have sufficient geographic variation? Then fourth, is the dependent variable geographically measurable? And fifth, do we have information on the timing of the implementation? So now I would like to guide you through this. We in our uh, institute use this uh, at methods workshop at the beginning to try to find out, okay, is, is a geospatial analysis and maybe what kind of type is helpful for us. So let's start with the opposite. Um, when can we not use geoda geodata or when it's maybe not feasible uh, or helpful? So if we decide that our evaluation interest uh, doesn't have a geographic dimension, for example, we evaluate strategic alignment, then it may be not possible or feasible for us to use a spatial analysis. Um, sometimes it's tricky, sometimes we have to, like in administrative measures that we want to look at, for example, decentralization, and maybe we want to look at an, uh, like, um, more for the strategic parts, but maybe also there are some outcomes that we could maybe also look at geographically. So um, it's worth reflecting this. Uh, secondly, do we know the location? If we don't know the location, it's hard to create our maps, especially we need your project data. And uh, thirdly, um, if we don't have enough geographic variation, it's hard to, or like we maybe won't get so many um, insights uh, through a geospatial analysis. So ideally, the, um, the projects are scattered on a large area and also have like a geographic uh, variability. So what I want to point out here also is the importance of uh, georeferencing and this is our goal that we have. Like, um, there are many, like, um, many data out there, and we just have to source them and to find them uh, to use them for us. For example, we can manually georeference our data if we have project data and look um, with, for example, text mining, uh, what locations do we have, and maybe build our own data sets. Or we can use satellite data to do it with the GIS software. Uh, secondly, we can also incorporate uh, geocoding in our data collection process if we uh, conduct our own surveys. Um, or we can gather data that includes geospatial information, for example, social media data that have a geotag. And yeah, fourthly, there are many databases already outside with georeference information, for example, from the MapMe in initiative or also from Aid Data, the GeoQuery, um, that maybe help us to, yeah, to use data. So going back to the, um, the geodata decision tree, uh, if we don't answer the first questions that, uh, with no but with yes, we can already conduct our first analysis, uh, at least with a non-causal focus. For example, we can do a descriptive mapping, and here you can see the strength on a one like view. You can already see some focal points or differences um, in the, um, on the map. For example, here at the um, uh, Climate Vulnerability uh, Index uh, for Costa Rica. 
Um, another um, importance is worth noting the, um, that we can use geodata to integrate many data sources. So they can be an anchor point, for example, here using DH uh, cluster points to merge many different data that we have. And also, it can be helpful to inform our case selection. Um, here you can see the NDVI um, for a region in South Africa. And on the uh, lower part, you see some um, brown areas and some yellow areas. So there's, um, there's a difference that maybe can help us um, to select different municipalities for our uh, ongoing study. Um, yeah. So going back, we can also look at um, analysis with a causal focus. And um, I would like to guide you to uh, last two examples. Um, if we have the question after we decide, okay, we have sufficient geographic variation, um, is the dependent variable geographically measurable? So do we know the location on Earth, for example, through point data, through uh, line data or polygon data, for example, we can see the infrastructure, we have uh, nighttime data or uh, something like this. If we don't have this, maybe we can also still use geodata um, or uh, spatial uh, data uh, at our independent, uh, for independent variables. For example, um, we could mice use in a regression model rural versus urban, we can use the country or climate zones or a proximity to, uh, to next school, schools. And um, the last path that I want to guide you through, if we answer all five questions with yes, um, so we also have information on the timing of the implementation, then maybe a geospatial impact evaluation will be feasible. And um, a ge uh, yeah, geospatial impact evaluation attempts to causally connect the intervention with geographical measurable changes in the environment, as you can see here, and we will have like later a talk of Masha Rauschenbach, um, where we did an uh, evaluation of um, irrigation projects in Mali together with uh, aid data. And the strength of it this lies here that we can, uh, can analyze uh, causal effects, that we have objective data, that we can look to uh, back for long-term periods of maybe over 20 years. And this can really uh, be yeah, helpful for our uh, evaluation. So to sum it up, um, the geodata decision tree um, is serving as an orientation framework in the inception phase. And we as evaluators should determine um, whether the evaluation has any geographic dimension. If we have data that are available and uh, where feasible, maybe we should also support or utilize georeference. So geodata and geospatial analysis uh, can both yeah, help for causal and non-causal evaluations. So we are not only um, need to do geospatial impact evaluations, and especially it's geodata are helpful for method integration. So we should at the beginning think how can we combine it with many different uh, maybe other methods that we have. So yeah, I hope this was helpful for you and maybe in the future you can also utilize this for your yeah, evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kai. Um, yeah, a very good public good. Is this on your website, I assume? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. okay. So we'll put a link uh, at some point also so you can access this really good resource. Um, so we're making our way, right, from strategy and program to then like making a decision within your evaluation design um, as to whether there is potential, for what purpose. I really liked your example of, you know, helping in selecting case studies. You know, that that's seems like a no-brainer, but we, we don't always do that. Oh, uh, so that's, that was very interesting. And now with our next speaker, uh, Kunwar Singh, um, who is Senior Geospatial Scientist at the Global Research Institute uh, and Affiliate Faculty at the Williams and Mary Center for Geospatial Analysis. We are going to delve a little bit more into this measurement aspect, right? So. We have images, we have signals from satellites. How do we go from that to concepts and constructs that we measure and that we will use in our evaluation? Um, so as soon as the slides are up, Kunwar, it's over to you. Thank you.
good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sabine and uh, Stella, for, in, for, in, for the invitation. And uh, uh, Kai and Claire's uh, presentation set a wonderful uh, foundation what we can do with geospatial data and methods. So in this presentation, I will talk about innovation in remote sensing that can be, be a powerful force to move geospatial impact evaluation forward. When we talk about, when we think about uh, advancement in remote sensing, we often think about improved sensor uh, computational resources. While this is important, I, I will delve deeper into how remote sensing data can be analyzed and uh, utilized to drive this uh, paradigm shift in geospatial impact evaluation. Remote sensing imagery and process data are offer, uh, offers valuable insights into various aspects of geospatial impact evaluation. That includes uh, expanding sample beyond uh, ground observation, estimating uh, diverse effects of intervention, facilitating more frequent reassessment, establishing pre-intervention trends, directly mapping and uh, observing impacts of interventions, and adding biophysical data products. <coughs> I will explore these concepts into the context of plant phen uh, phenology, crop conditions, evapotranspirations, ecohydrological modeling, and if time allows, in cloud, compu uh, cloud computing. So remote sensing can help, means there are a few, I will walk through a few cases quickly in very simplified way, so if you have questions, we can discuss later also. So remote sensing can help us to study plant phenology. Plant phenology is an, uh, is an observation of plant growth stages uh, uh, throughout, uh, across the air plant's life, okay? Like a greening up, vegetative growth, maturity, senescence, and dorm dormant phase. Currently, we are right now in uh, green up phase. If you go out, you will see there's a leaf that is sprouting, you know? So we can use time series remote sensing data to estimate vegetation indices that can help to develop plant phenology. <laughs> And plant, plant phenology, for example, here can help us to identify time period when certain uh, vegetation has different spectral property than other vegetation type. For example, in this, if you see uh, between March and April, phenology is entirely different from all three different vegetation types, like evergreen, deciduous, and um, ligastrum sinus, which is an invasive plant. This approach can help basically help us to pick the best satellite data for that time period to do mapping vegetation types. Another example is we can use this time series uh, approach to understand how vegetation responds to climatic variation. In this case, you can see grass greenness, which is green in color, correlates with precipitation in dry lands. This can, these two examples are excellent uh, ways to understand various interventions related to reforestation, uh, like a, a variation in uh, crop types. Next example is remote sensing, of, remote sensing of crop conditions. Again, we can use time series remote sensing data to identify areas of infected crop with other healthier crop, and that way we can imp implement resources to maintain the crop productivity over time. This is excellent ways to use remote sensing <coughs> to improve, uh, improve cro crop productivity in areas where uh, countries where resource, uh, resources are limited. This example Kai talked about where we use uh, remote sensing to study crop productivities. In that we use uh, vegetation and water indices to understand how Irrigation infrastructure impacts climate resilience of smallholders forming community in Mali. If you see, you will see, um, you will see that Im increased NDVI, and NDVI means improved water availability for crop productivities after the intervention. Here's another example how we can use the same time series remote sensing data to establish phenology of crop, which is like a fingerprint of crop, differentiate crop from other crop types. This uh, graph shows basically phenology of sugarcane, where January is like a sowing time and 
September time is like har when farmers harvest sugarcane in Nepal and Indians uh, that uh, Ganges plains of India region. Now, if we use the similar concept, this this approach, we can differentiate different crop varieties, which is one of the main uh, uh, drivers whenever we want to have a geospatial impact evaluation in climate smart agriculture interventions. Here we used sugarcane uh, phenology to differentiate different crop types at farm level. This produce means this approach can produce far accurate uh, better results than pixel level analysis of crop types. And then this approach can also expedite and we can do repeat analysis that Claire talked about the scal scalability. Means it's often we develop a um, framework or method, but then it's hard to apply in different geography or different context. This approach can expedite that kind of approach. Then comes remote sensing of evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is like a one solid measurement of various climatic conditions like pre uh, precipitation, temperature, humidity, wind, mist, just name it. If we can estimate evapotranspiration, we can do water management, we can, do water, we can understand what, how much water we can save by replacing uh, crop that, has, that relies on a small amount of water compared to water demanding crops. So here in the graph, it shows that increase in uh, uh, plant cover of uh, certain vegetation types increases evapotranspiration that leads reduced runoff. We can use variety of surface energy balance model to develop ET from Landsat, Sentinel to understand hydrologic response of vegetation types. And here's an example. This is a study I conducted few, uh, two, uh, two years ago where I estimated evapotranspiration of one invasive plant and compared with two native evergreen and deciduous plants. And it shows that if we use this evapotranspiration approach and re we remove, after the study, we remove the invasive plants, we can save almost one third cumulative water of uses of evergreen and deciduous plant in that, in that particular geography. And that also shows how different vegetation types respond to water resources at the, uh, over time. I'm going very fast with different use cases, but I'm trying to give you different flavors, how, what we can do with remote sensing. This is another example. It's, uh, it, it vapor transpiration from different with crop types with a different surface, like some where there's more ground surface uh, open soil with, uh, with some where there's a uh, small amount of uh, open surface. So means there's a different landscape that we can accommodate to understand how those crop types, they are yielding evapotranspiration. This is one of the most powerful modeling when it comes to utilizing remote sensing data more efficiently. Just a lot is going on, but in very simple way, eco-hydrological uh, eco modeling can help us to understand different scenarios in cl uh, climate smart, smart agriculture, uh, agriculture. In this case, I, did, I ran analysis in California, Modesto, where I re replaced vineyard, uh, replaced uh, almond with vineyards. Almond demands a lot of water, while California until a few years ago there was water scarcity while vineyard, they rely on a small amount of water. So in this eco-hydrological modeling, if we keep business as usual, if we replace, replace almond with 30, it means 30% al almond, 33% almond with vineyard and 66% and then 100%, we can save almost 38% of water by replacing almond with vineyard. In this eco-hydrological modeling, we use cropland types, soil types, different parameters from this elevation model, and then we run the analysis using climatic conditions. And when, then we do vari various assessment model performance, and then finally we have the results. What that means is that we can use these concept, we can power our geospatial impact evaluation way, and it can yield a lot of information, not only help us making decision to move forward with type of crops, variety of crops, uh, and uh, also fertilizer uses, water uses, just name it. 
This particular model can yield almost 50 different parameters. In, in, in fact, it can help us to know amount of soil erosion over time. Then last is cloud computing. I think this is one of the most uh, innovative in the recent times. There are multiple sources, but I rely and I encourage others to use Google because it's a, a free of cost. You can, we can use Google, that Google Earth Engine, and we can implement all these concepts of what I explained to you, develop various apps, like this one is Global Forest uh, uh, Change, which is commonly available. Next one is uh, grazing intensity. You know, in, a, in developing countries, uh, often uh, means uh, pastoral communities, they rely on livestock. This can help us to understand where are the resources, are grazing resources where uh, uh, farmers can rely on. Then the last one is flood mapping, where we can use time series, remote sensing with Google Earth Engine, and we can do automate process. We have to select an area and we can get to know. Areas prone to flooding, in the past areas flooded, all information with one click. So what that means is that while it is Im important to keep attention or focus on improved sensors, different uh, computer, computational resources, it's, always, it's also great to know, uh, focus on how we innovatively we can utilize remote sensing data to inform our geospatial impact evaluation, regardless of uh, geography, the climatic condition, to scale up various Im uh, uh, geospatial impact evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kunwar. Um, a lot to think about, about you know, like the richness of this data, how to harness it into indicators that we can then really study from an evaluation point of view. You, you gave us a, a really good appetite for, for figuring this out. Um, so we're running quite on time, which is great, and we have quite a, a bit of time for questions, for comments for also sharing your own uh, experience. Um, I know I have quite a few questions uh, lined up, um, but I would like to give you priority. Um, so I can, any, anyone there, I mean, please, there, is, there are mics. It would be wonderful if you could use one of the mics on the, at the table, if you have a question in the back so that our colleagues online can, uh, can hear you. Or, or I can also, we have another mic actually. Yep. All right, great, thanks. Come on. Uh, yeah, uh, and please oh, introduce go. yourself. So we oh, sure, um, I'm uh, Robert Harrison and work with uh, ITS Geospatial. Um, I have a question for uh, Gunwar. The um, analysis that you were showing, it looked like it was, it was mainly looking at uh, precipitation but did, have you done any any of that type of work uh, looking at irrigation and, and um, more specifically looking at the the sort of the the signature over time of the vegetation health and the precipitation? Uh, are you able to infer like where there are irrigated crops? To, uh, or have you have, have you worked on like assessing irrigation schemes using that kind of methodology? Thank you. Answer is yes. I already gave you a teaser about that work, and Rachel share. Uh, she will be presenting. She's here. She will be presenting about that that type of work later session. So yes, to to elaborate more a little bit on that remote sensing data, time series remote sensing data from the Landsat, Sentinel, or any other uh, uh, high resolution like planar scope can help us to understand this uh, how irrigation is affected, how um, crop productivity other parameters within in that geography like child nutrition, the social well-being. Another thing is that about uh, the similar data can also help us to under understand evapotranspiration, particularly, for example, if we do reforestation and now we want to know whether it's that effort is yielding up, made, making any progress or not, we can simply estimate time series evapotranspiration. Increased evapotranspiration will show more vegetation activity. In fact, vapor transpiration is one of the one of the best in, 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 uh, index that can combine multiple parameters into one, compared to just relying on uh, NDVI or 
greenness of vegetation. Any other questions in the room for now? Yes, Bahar? I think you have to switch it on, there is a little, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to see some of the familiar faces and also some of the new faces. I'm Bahar Salimova. I used to be in IAG before. I'm a senior operations officer in FCV Group's uh, geo-enabling for monitoring and supervision I initiative. Um, a few of you mentioned physical data collection for geospatial analysis and tools that the clients actually use and now are continuing to use um, throughout their, uh, even after their implementation or your engagement. I think Claire, you specifically said, could you elaborate a little bit on what tools and also what are some lessons learned in terms of the uptake and upskilling your clients? So something to do, something not to do, because we're working on very similar approaches. Thank you. Claire, do you want to take that? Thank you for your question. Uh, so the tool I mentioned was uh, what was possible to to estimate the land use and estimate uh, the 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 rice yield uh, in uh, in Senegal. Um, so the thing is, uh, our clients there uh, is doing a lot of projects to improve uh, uh, rice productivity. And uh, one of the main intervention is irrigation. Uh, so, and they they had a lot of uh, data collected from the ground, but they had limitation because they were not able to cover uh, all their areas or not as um, as often as they would like like uh, for management project. So, with one specific project we support uh, as uh, AFD there. Uh, we decided to work together on how to improve uh, the way they were able to, to follow through time um, the, the evolution of uh, the rice productivity. So this is a very specific uh, application, uh, but the thing is it was their main need at that time, uh, so they keep using it not only for the project we are supporting, but uh, also for for other of their program and, and changing the way uh, they are implementing the project because they discover that uh, it was, yeah, there were space to improve uh, the way that they were uh, implementing. Um, thank you, Claire. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a theme also that I would really like us to kind of explore is, is the client side and the uptake you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, seeing things on the map, the visualization aspect can really also help in in uh, getting the clients and other stakeholders along the evaluation journey, perhaps more than than text and 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 uh, so that's something that I, I would like also to to reflect on uh, throughout. Sabine. So uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Sabine Durier. I run knowledge and communications at IEG. Um, so that was very fascinating. Um, I have no technical understanding of the topic, so this is a definitely good introduction for me. I have a question for you, Claire. Uh, you mentioned first that uh, relying on awareness, training, and piloting was very important. I can assume it is. Do you do this also with the staff within IFD? And in what way do you uh, implement this? Because that's something we can be doing, of course, in AEG as well as more broadly with operations. And my second question concerns the partnerships, which obviously make all of you made very compelling uh, cases for, for partnerships. Do you consider private sector actors as part of your partners? For example, do you work with Proparco and data provided by Proparco? Thank you. Uh, and just for the first question about the dark car example, uh, I will be happy to share. We have some uh, uh, some documents and reports uh, on this specific case, and we add also a, a project evaluation available, so we can discuss further. And the interesting point for your comments, Estelle, is also to learn with the client uh, what is not uh, feasible 
I mean, because they all thought that it will answer all the problem and that it will be something that could replace the monitoring system or think or design a monitoring system. And this is not the answer. So it's, it's quite obvious for all of us in the room. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you dialogue with the clients, it's not that obvious that it's not the solution for everything and you need to think about what you want to measure and follow. And so this dialogue was interesting with, uh, um, with Saed in Dakar, our clients, to, um, to show them what was not possible because it was my example. Things are not uh, working. Uh, thank you for your uh, question. Yes, so uh, we are training also internally uh, our our team. We are tra training ourselves because again, this is new topic. We are not experts, uh, so we we started by uh, training ourselves with some of the uh, friendly face in the room, um, and uh, so we st we started internally. But then we realized that uh, it was more efficient to increase the awareness uh, internally. To, to do some external partnership. And then uh, people inside were much more interesting about attending our um, training uh, sessions or conference uh, and communication is very useful as well uh, to, to, yeah, to raise the awareness uh, within the AFD. And I mean, it's just the beginning we are keeping doing that. So of course, um, operation or, or, or our geographical expert, they don't have to be expert of this kind of techniques, but they need basic, they need to know how they can do with it uh, to be able to ask for it. Otherwise we offer things that our colleague do not ask for because they don't know why they can do with that. Um, and I would say that we are still at this stage. I'm not sure that we, yeah, we are much more advanced than that. Karen uh, yeah. uh, So my evaluation director is here and we just uh, passed our new evaluation strategy uh, a weeks ago. Um, and this new evaluation strategy is not the AEFD evaluation strategy, but a group evaluation strategy, uh, giving the, sig the signal that we should work more uh, with our uh, pro, um, pro barco, so private sector, but uh, also Expertise France, which, which is a, an implementation agency um, in the group. So, um, so far, we, we had some discussion with them and they are very interested about uh, joining forces to, to do better. But to be honest, it's just uh, the, the premise of, of, of this discussion. Um, but now it's official, it's in our uh, evaluation, uh, new evaluation monitoring and evaluation policy for the group. Um, and definitely as IEFD, uh, we want, we are keen to, but we have uh, to share this knowledge and, and, and work with the private sector uh, in this direction. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for, for Kai. Um, I mean, so this decision tree, I think, is a, is a really good tool. We, we developed ours as well to in, in the awareness raising and in, in trying to uh, foster some kind of common language, common understanding. I, one key point in your decision tree was the, the geo-referencing of interventions or projects. We need to know where projects are in order to, to, uh, to leverage some of these. I wanted to ask um, you about how, whether you've been able to, to use your incipient work to um, increase the, the, the geotagging, the georeferencing um, of the different agencies that you are overseeing, um, or also how, how can we leverage that? I mean, the bank has a, as a, as a, as a team who is in charge of geotagging. We have a little bit of a back and forth with them. Sometimes we realize there is missing data or it's not as precise as we would like. I would just be curious to see how, how you've been able to, to do that as well. 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, as an evaluation institute, we are like uh, yeah, um, we don't collect like usually like the project information, and so we are like um, dependent on the the yeah, implementing organizations if they do it right and collect the data that we need. And but we also try to advocate on different levels. For example, um, also on political level, our federal ministry uh, was just uh, is just currently working on a um, data strategy, and there we really advocate to use um, geodata uh, at the project level, and that this is like um, um, that we need those data for many different analyses that we want to do, and there are also some. The rears, especially like civil organizations, they have some, um, they are, see also the risk of uh, geodata to present them because it may be a, a later a danger for um, the implementers uh, at the local level if we are like in fragile context. Uh, context. So we really try to yeah, um, spread the knowledge, but also like try to advocate on a specific level. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Sabine and then Harsh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thanks for well, really interesting uh, presentations. I, I just have three general questions for the, for the whole panel. I'm wondering, so from my limited understanding uh, of, of this topic, I'm, it seems to me that um, that in order, if I've understood correctly, in order to look at some form of impact, you need time series in geospatial or remote sensing data. And to what extent in, in your institutions is this being integrated into the project cycle? So to what extent are projects collecting baseline data in order to then build this time series? Because I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand how you have access to this time series. It just exists or or you're actually collecting your institutions, the operational side of the institution is collecting this data throughout the, the process. Uh, the second question is related to uh, Sabine, the other Sabine's question about uh, getting teams to use these tools. So in IEG, uh, you know, we have a very strong methods team experts in, in all these tools, but you know, to get the, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, the evaluation teams don't necessarily know what these tools can, how they can use them, when they can use them, and then they're used to doing evaluations in a certain way, and it's so much easier to just fall back on how you've always been doing things. So any experience you have in how do you get, you know, how do you get teams to, to, to use these tools? And then the last one was about the modeling that um, Kumar was, uh, was talking about. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, if I've understood, or maybe I didn't understand correctly, but so you used remote sensing data to build the model, and then you, is this a kind of ex ante impact assessment? The one, the example on California where moving from almonds to vineyards saved 38% uh, water. Is that, did you use the remote sensing to build the model and then use it to estimate the impact, or you know, were you using ex post data? I'm, I'm just wondering this because I, I do have a question. I mean, I do think that in evaluation we can do, we can use models, the with and without project scenario, even though it's not like an ex post coming to look at the situation. But it is, you are estimating in some sense the impact. But it is a rigorous way of looking at the with and without project scenario. So if if you could elaborate on that, thank you. Great question, thank you. Um, anyone wants to start? Claire? Yes, okay. Um, so, thank you, Sabine. Uh, for the time series, uh, so from the sky, the thing that it's great is that it's, all, it's available. So, the project team uh, did not have to think about it before. Uh, they are there, you just what you need is to know what is your area of intervention. This is the tricky part. Uh, but once you know what is the intervention area, uh, many satellitary images are available on and, and remote sensing data on different uh, indicators. 
Um, so this is part of the answer. But uh, again, you will be able to measure some indicators, not all the one you are interested in, and no magic there. For the one you would like from the ground, for the population, for uh, other things that you cannot observe uh, uh, from the sky, definitely uh, we still have to work uh, with, the, with the team for them to collect the data during their monitoring system or at the baseline because they're really interesting in about impact. Um, there are a lot for the, for the geodata, special, um, geodata information, a lot are, um, are free. And, uh, but the, what, I mean, our interest now is to understand um, until what is the potential of the free geodata. And now we are much more, and that's why we build some partnership with the French Spatial Agency and we are discussing with the European Spatial Agency, is we do need much more precise data. So we need to buy the data or build partnership to have, have access to them. But still, they, if they are available in the past, if we pay for them afterwards, it works. So this is the, uh, something very interesting related to geodata information. Uh, for your second question uh, on how the team uh, can uh, use uh, these tools, images, information, etc. Uh, we are still struggling, so, um, but what we found, very practical way of internal organization, if we, like you, we have a specific, uh, so we don't call ourselves methods, but we are an impact evaluation team with inside economists and data scientists who know how to use this kind of data, uh, who try to keep them trained on uh, what we can do or not do with this data. Uh, we invest a lot on, on what is possible in geospatial impact evaluation. So now we are communicating about what works, what doesn't, and we, we use more frequently um, geo, geodata, geospatial analysis for impact evaluation. The, we are at that moment, and we are eager to, to keep discussing with you for country evaluation and for project evaluation. Because the way we do it now is someone from the impact evaluation team is jointly working with people who are handling much more project evaluation or country evaluation to see if there is a potential somewhere and help them to implement that. Um, the idea at the end is that they, will, they won't need us anymore and they will have the the idea every time to do that by themselves. And also the specific impact evaluation team, we do have a more limited number, but we still do some project, some project evaluation. So like that, we can know what is the potential for this kind of evaluation of geospatial data. Not only seeing the impact measurement, but also how it can yeah, raise the potential and the quality and, uh, of the project evaluation. Thank you. We're close to our time. Maybe, uh, Kai, you want to very briefly maybe say something yeah, about the update? Like yeah. Um, yes. Um, um, how we, uh, we are getting teams to use uh, geospatial analysis. That's what we wanted to uh, show with the uh, geodata decision tree. It's not always the geospatial impact evaluation that we have to do. Um, that's why we try to talk and talk and communicate uh, also at the early stage of the evaluation and um, the potentials, maybe it's just uh, like a map that can visualize something. This can also be really helpful like for the analysis. And, um, and also I think that's what we need to do. Like we are all working on the same uh, issues. I think the idea is really valuable to like integrate this in the community of practice so that we can like easily like share the knowledge and like to show the potentials also to to get the start uh, easier because i think there are like many analytical um, designs that were already proven so we don't have to start always at the beginning and yeah i think that's thank you and in a nutshell kunwar on the estimation perhaps 
You need to switch on your mic, sorry. So I will extend what Claire and Kai said a little bit, little bit. So yes, we do need some fundamental this baseline data, uh, data, data set to run any geospatial impact evaluation. The, the upside is that we can use time series remote sensing data to augment existing baseline data to expand the geography. We can also, in some cases, we can retrospectively refine, uh, we can collect more ground observation data using remote sensing data. In case of uh, sugarcane mapping, we have only a few years for ground, obs uh, means ground observation data, but we use the same data, we identify and collected new ground observation data just using Earth observation means remote sensing, time series remote sensing. That's first, and second one is about how to get a team to use different geospatial thing. I think it comes down to what is a, we are trying to achieve at the end. If our, uh, and how efficiently we want to use means cost effectiveness. So sometimes like when we do ground observation collection, it's kind of time and both cost, both it, it cost. Uh, we can use drones. Advantage, advantage of drones that if we add all the details in mission planning in advance, we can revisit hundreds of time. Just we have to feed the details and let drone go and collect all the data. Within within few hours, we can means collect hundreds of plots data. That's the uh, second part. The third part, the use case I showed you about for, for, uh, for the uh, California, we had crop types for uh, uh, almond. We knew in advance before that almond takes more water compared to vineyard, and then we wanted to see how if we do for entire geography, how things can happen. So what that means is that having some initial data, we can plug into various other existing baseline data, for example, soil types. This global data set available. We can utilize that. Some like for, for the United States, we have very refined data and they keep updating year by year. This then comes digital elevation model. We have 30 meter resolution data, uh, digital elevation model at global scale. We can use that information to have various uh, means various indices. For example, aspect in the landscape impacts growth of vegetation. Means south facing has a lower amount of vegetation compared to north facing. So that information can can be added into any kind of like reforestation that or how reforestation is impacting. And so what means combining all these, we can help. Means we can develop this kind of eco-hydrological model, not only just to replace crop types, but also any kind of like, for example, in climate smart agriculture, we, if we have demilunes, means like rainwater harvesting structure. If we add that, then we can see how things are progressing, crop yields, uh, nitrogen estimation, biomass estimation, carbon estimation, uh, soil erosion, means all the parameters at the end we will have for multiple years that can help us make decisions more efficiently. Thank you, Kunwar. Um, yeah, I see one question here. We we are two minutes after the supposed break. Maybe you ask it, and then we think about it during the break. We can get back to you. Um, and Harsh, I know I'm on the hook for a question for you, but you'll stay, right? Yes. Okay. Um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Liana Rezafindrazi from uh, Virgil and Dublin for monitoring and supervision. Uh, I have uh, one, two questions actually. I was wondering from your experience, uh, what are actually the main pain points in applying uh, geospatial analysis um, into evaluation? Uh, so I have few ideas in mind, but uh, you know, based on your experiences, if you could briefly share that. And then the other thing is, um, so we know that monitoring data are actually uh, important also for evaluation at some point, right? Uh, do you work with teams, work, or, you know, um, or do you encourage also the use of geospatial analysis or you know geospatial data at the monitoring, um, you know, level? Thank you. These are great questions. I think the challenges, the pinpoints, we're going to thread that during during the day. Um, so we'll. we'll We'll get back to this. Um, and then on the monitoring, we'll have examples in the next sessions also where it's actually been used, not just for evaluation, but for monitoring as well. Um, but we'll, we'll, 
you can also uh, ask our panelists during the coffee. Um, we it's our first session. We have many more to go. I would invite you to have a stand-up refreshment. There are some things outside here, and we will reconvene uh, now in 10, 12 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. See you soon.